I'll just push record when you want to where we should be recording. Thank you everyone for coming today and thank you for helping us kick off the 16th annual capabilities demonstration for star tides. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to uh, that uh, Provost Ginsburg has chosen to uh, be with us today. So without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to Provost to uh, kick off the event. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. You bet. Well, thank you. I thank you everybody who's here today and others who are joining us online for a very important meeting and a very important series of discussions over the next couple of days on behalf of our more than 39,000 students and 11,000 faculty and staff. It's really a pleasure to welcome you to this, these conversations and to these meetings. As you were saying, it's the 16th annual gathering. I didn't realize that until we spoke the other day. Uh, but what it's about is even more important than its longevity. It's about the capabilities of demonstrating a global knowledge and a global sharing network. And the Star Tides network is indeed uh, very impressive. Mm -hmm. Building sustainable resilience, supporting community, supporting individual resilience as well, will help us all to build both natural and man-made solutions to the disasters that we have faced, and frankly, to the disasters that we will soon un almost certainly have to confront. Uh, I spoke this morning at another interesting day at Mason. There were two events on climate taking place. It was an event this morning in our Arlington campus, and it was focused on working in some similar ways to what you do at Star Tides, but creating municipal plans from the smallest villages all the way up to the largest government entities, members of the state legislature, members of several universities. And what I said this morning, I'll say to you as well, is that it's often said that it takes a village but we have to start one village at a time. We have to start, start one place at a time. And some of the work that Star Tides has done in communities across the country, across the world, across uh, really across the whole planet has been really uh, quite, quite remarkable. Since uh, 2007, Star Tides has been about this involvement with a wide array of real world capacity building, real world disaster relief, and real world projects focused on doing what's important to construct and distribute renewable energy in ways that make a real difference. Uh, I learned the other day about the work in Puerto Rico that's tremendously impressive and the work in places like Puerto Rico that have experienced disasters but have been under-resourced for decades in dealing with the problems they face and the problems that they will face. And so this year's theme, the theme of sustainable resilience in the face of climate change is both timely and important. It's also empowering, I think, empowering of some of the most significant and complex but consequential issues of our time. I, I said this morning to the group, and I'll say to you this afternoon too, I don't think there's any more important set of issues that we as humans have to confront than will be the challenges that climate change will bring to us, as well as the uh, implications that is, it has had on communities. But it's also very propitious that this notion of sustainable resilience in the face of climate change is taking place right as we start Earth Week 2023. Uh, I know that was planned, um, but even with it being planned, it is uh, more than parenthetic. It really is quite symbolic uh, that as we think of Earth Week this year, which falls this coming Saturday, I believe, uh, that these conversations, these important conversations are consequential and these important conversations hopefully uh, will make a difference. You know, this work is also very consistent with our strategic vision for George Mason University, the strategic vision of building relationships and empowering partnerships that make a difference for communities, that make a difference for industry, that makes a difference for government. And that a second path of our strategic vision for the university is to be involved in facilitating, not just creating, but facilitating sustainable pathways. And, and so my hope is that these conversations and that George Mason's involvement in these conversations will help to further uh, allow and create success uh, for star tides. And there are some real life examples, uh, work that are going place right here in Fairfax City in the great Commonwealth of Virginia and Fairfax County in the city of Manassas where we have another campus or science and technology campus in Prince William County. The work of the Virginia Climate Center which is making a real world difference on Virginia's vulnerability and our exposure to the impact of climate change. 
the Center for Science, uh, Energy Science and Policy, a joint initiative of our, of our Shar School of Policy and Government, our College of Science and the School of Business is multi, also a multidisciplinary and very vibrant energy science and policy hub initiative that's here at George Mason University. And so the work that's taking place synergistically within our university and synergistically within the larger community is really, uh, really important. In 2021, uh, the local climate change planning initiative was created and that too is having a real world difference to facilitate the work of governments throughout the Commonwealth to think critically, carefully, strategically, and I would hope successfully about these issues. And so as we move forward, there really is no better beacon for what Mason's professors, uh, Jason Kinter and Ed Maybach recently wrote in an op-ed piece for the Richmond Times-Dispatch in thinking about talking today. I read that op-ed over the weekend and, and just to quote a couple of sentences from it, which to me brought real meaning and hopefully will be meaning for you too. Uh, Kinter and Maybach wrote just recently that ignoring a problem that continues to get worse is rarely a wise option. A better approach is to do what is necessary to understand the problem and find solutions to address it. That's what you're trying to do. And that's what collaboratively we try to do at George Mason University. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you for the invitation to speak briefly to you. I know the next couple of days will be inspiring. I hope they'll also lead to great success in the work that you do. Also very pleased to say that the US Naval Postgraduate School is partnering in this event. I'd like to personally thank uh, the Post -Naval, uh, Naval Postgraduate School President Vice Admiral Ann Rando uh, for her and her team for her support of this initiative and for the work that we're taking place. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Admiral, and thank all of you who support, participate in, and are part of the Star Types Initiative. So thank you very much. I wish you well, and thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Todd. And echo, echoing Dr. Wells and Ginsburg again, welcome again to George Mason University and our annual Star Tides. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Mr. Craig Fugate. Not only is Craig a fellow colleague, he is also a friend. I'm eternally grateful for his willingness and availability to be here with us this week as we celebrate the 16th Capabilities Demonstration. And pondering what to share with you all today, I immediately thought of how we at times refer to Craig and the emergency management field as Florida, FEMA, Fugate. <laughs> Craig was confirmed by the U.S. Senate and began his service as administrator of FEMA in May 20, 2009. At FEMA, he promulgated the whole community approach to emergency management, emphasizing and improving collaboration with all levels of government, and more importantly, external partners, including voluntary agencies, faith-based organizations, the private sector, and citizens. Under his leadership, emergency management has been promoted as a shared responsibility to build sustainable and resilient communities. So what better partner than CRASC here at George Mason University? Craig is also known for his Waffle House Index, whereby he determines the level of attention a disaster area requires based on whether the Waffle House is open at the time of the emergency. Craig told the New York Times that Waffle House has a very simple operating philosophy, get open. His theory that is that if Waffle House is open, keep driving. If it's damaged but serving a limited situation, it's really bad and probably needs the most attention. The strategy is particularly helpful in the South, where he is from, as well as myself, but becomes a challenge elsewhere because Waffle House isn't as popular as local chains in the North, Northeast, out West, and in the Midwest as uh, Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts. Remember, South is a place, North is a direction. <laughs> <laughs> Like that one. Prior to FEMA, Craig served as director of the Florida Division of Emergency Management, coordinating 11 presidentially declared disasters, including the management of $4.5 billion in disaster aid from the feds. In 2004, he managed the largest federal disaster response in Florida history as four major hurricanes impacted the state in quick succession. And then in 2005, we all know what happened. Obviously, Florida was a again impacted by major disasters with three more hurricanes, including tropical storm Katrina at the time. Are you done yet? No. Why? Oh, I got more for you, Craig. 
The impact from Hurricane Katrina was felt more strongly in the northern Gulf states. Under Emergency Management Assistant Compact, Florida launched the largest mutual aid response in its history. So technically, Florida was there to help as well. It was Hurricane Katrina that pulled my attention from intelligence gathering to emergency management. Happy to share all of that with you later. But there was some a pesky little fishing trip involved, some Plaquemines Parish, and a radio uh, announcement saying that Hur Tropical Storm Katrina was not going to do anything damaging to anywhere, but we see what happened. Since that time, I've followed his professional and impressive career, relating my own efforts to disaster, anything and everything. And over the years, we have had time and time again to be connected through a number of professional associations and like-minded associates. After all, isn't that what Star Tides is about? Strengthening the nodes and your knowledge sharing network so you can have reach back in a way you would not have otherwise. So please give me a please give a warm welcome to Mr. Craig Fugate, the 2016 National Emergency Management Association Lacey E. Souter Awardee for Lifetime Achievements and Contributions in the Field of Emergency Management. Craig, for being here today. Generally, I just tell people, say, hi, I'm Craig. Um, Waffle House has taken on uh, mythology of its own, <laughs> but there was a practicality to it. And the reason it became a practicality is I was trying to speed up response. And this is something Star Ties has wrestled with. When disasters happen, usually the first question everybody comes up with, well, how do we know it's bad? And a lot of effort is placed on reconnaissance, getting information, getting people in, getting data back. And I said, okay, let me ask you a question. What outcome did you achieve? We know it's bad. Oh, okay. How long did it take you to know it was bad? A day or two. Okay, so for a day or two, what have you done to change the outcome? We now know it's bad. I'm like, that's process. I was trying to get our teams to get going faster. We've heard this term, you're on your own for the first 72 hours. You know, we, we, we hear that, you know, in the U.S., we base our disaster response upon locals impacted, overwhelmed goes to state, states overwhelmed goes to FEMA, like the dominoes have to all fall. Well, what Katrina showed us was we don't get time back, and you have to collapse that down. And what I figured out in the 2004 hurricane season, if I ran the traditional model where the first people going out were to do the assessments, it would be 72 hours before we got anything on the ground to change the outcome. So we changed the parameter said, why don't we respond like it's bad? They're going, what do you mean? I'm like, it's a hurricane, right? We know about the wind speed that's going to hit. We know the area it's going to be hit. We know a lot about the area, surprisingly, that we don't have to wait for a disaster to occur to go, it's going to be bad. Why don't we just respond? As bad? Well, what are we responding to? I said, well, how many people live there? I respond to people, not stuff. And that began this response to where in Hurricane Charlie, which was Friday the 13th in 2004, we were on the ground in the first 24 hours. By the time we got to the last storm, Hurricane Jean, we were on the ground as soon as the winds dropped below tropical force. But it always raised a question when you're driving into a storm. If you've ever been to a hurricane, if you're on the ground, you'll start seeing damages well before you get to the center of circulation. So that drove the question, well, how do you know we're there yet? And the answer was the Waffle House Index, which we had come up with in 2004. Uh, it was my meteorologist, Ben Nelson, and the National Guard Major, uh, uh, Tad Warfield, actually came up with the first one. But it was like, if it's open, it's green. If it's open with a limited menu, it's yellow. If it's closed, it's red. And we would just tell teams, the search and rescue teams, keep driving. And if the Waffle House is open with full menu, keep going. If it's open with a limited menu, that's probably mass care. All right. But that's not your mission right now. When you get to where the Waffle House is closed and it's not open, go to work. And so it was a way of defining those edges of looking at, again, Waffle House. But you can do this on a lot of things because like I would tell people, it's like taking a pulse. If you don't have a pulse, you have a real problem, right? And if you have a strong pulse, you're probably not my most critical patient, right? And the person with the threatening pulse I'm concerned about, but I'm not doing CPR on them, right? It's just a symptom. It's like a, a kind of a measure of, you know, what's a vital sign. And people say, well, that's very simplistic. And I'm like, you really want to make disasters more complex than they are? It worked. 
people say, well, it doesn't work anywhere else. I'm like, yeah, because very few places have that philosophy. But I'm, I'll give you an example of how this works. Remember the earthquake they had in California a couple of years ago? It was a pretty big earthquake, but it was out in the desert. And there was a lot of concern how bad it was. And the first images I saw from local EOC was they were in there drinking Starbucks. Okay, I'm from local government. I worked at local level. Trust me, nobody's budget, even the people in California have budgets to have Starbucks catering their EOC. So I made the assumption that they stopped and got Starbucks on the way to the EOC to go activate, which makes sense to me. That's what I would do, because if you ever drank EOC coffee, you'll get your Starbucks on the way in. So already I knew it wasn't that bad. People said, well, how do you know it's not that bad? I'm so, all right, anybody here been in the Starbucks? How are their coffee machines set up? They're plumbed on the municipal government water supply. Waffle House can run with no water or boil water orders because they pour their bottle of water in on top of their coffee makers. But a Waffle House can do that. Starbucks can't. Starbucks are plumped. So if you have no water pressure or boiled water pressure, they're closed. So if they're making coffee, think about all the things that have to take place. One, their employees had to be able to get to work. That means the roads are open. There may be damages, but they got to work, right? Two, they got to have electricity and they got to have water pressure and they can't have a boiled water work because they don't have generators and they have no way to pour bottled water in those coffee makers. And if the employees in the EOC are drinking coffee right off the bat, I already know as bad as that earthquake was, Somewhere in that community, they still had power, they still had water, they didn't have a boiled water or the bridges and roads were still passable. That probably tells me just by looking at that one image, this is a recovery operation, not a response operation. And it's, it's those kind of things that I tell people, quit thinking you gotta fly drones and spend all this fortune getting information that know it's bad. Because by the time you get that, what have you done? Why don't you respond like it's bad and adjust as you get information? But we're talking about climate. And climate's interesting because in my career, I'm a very pragmatic person who deals with what's in front of them. So everybody kept talking about climate change. And as far back as 2004, they were trying to make assertions that those four hurricanes were a result of climate change. The problem was natural variability accounted for all of these extreme weather events. These were not necessarily things that had never happened. The frequency of them was getting a little closer, but we seen this variability before where we saw a lot of activity in periods of quiet. So there wasn't anything quite distinguishing that. But as we went into the Obama administration, things were accelerated. Yet looking at that going forward, it didn't really come out with a clear signal that climate was doing something as much as we were seeing a lot of floods. Remember the Tennessee floods in 2010, Nashville it was not a tropical system. Saw some hurricanes, they were within the variability. Some really nasty tornadoes, Tuscaloosa, Joplin. But again, there had been worse. Wildfire seasons were starting to change. This was something we began measuring because in California, it went back to they were spending money longer for the fire season for their temporary firefighters. And they were only budgeted for so many months, yet the beginning and ending of fire season was now going beyond what they were budgeted for. And they were having to go back to the legislature and ask for more money. And if you remember, this was when Governor Brown is basically looking at billion dollar deficits in his budget and they're having to come back and find more money for firefighters. Alaska starts seeing their fire season increase, Washington State, Oregon. And these weren't just like variabilities year to year. This was a trend over 10 years. It was getting more extensive. Superstorm Sandy happens. Again, nothing that hadn't happened before. But it did start prompting some questions from my boss, who basically put it to me this way. Up until this point, there was still a lot of noise about whether climate change is real or not. And President Obama said, Craig, I think the debate about climate change is over. We need to start thinking about adaptation. And so from a FEMA standpoint, we go, OK. I get that, but what am I adapting to? Because every climate forecast was really, I guess, mainly for communicating public. We were always talking about sea level rise in inches over decades. How do you respond to that? But it turned out the other signals were actually increasing and now moving beyond the natural variability of what had happened in the past. And 
as we were getting towards the end of it, we were really focusing on our biggest vulnerability based upon the way we built our infrastructure in the U.S. was extreme rainfall events. Most people thought river rain flooding. I said, that's not the problem. We get river rain flooding. It is the urbanized flooding that was occurring from these extreme rainfall events, which we saw in 2016 in Baton Rouge. Again, a non-tropical system. Again, we had this really bad one in Tennessee in 2010. Columbia, South Carolina. I know this because Steve Spurrier quit that week as coach of the uh, mm -hmm. University of South Carolina. So they're dealing with this tremendous flood and the coach quits the team. And, you know, for the former Gator, I knew that. Um, but they almost lost their municipal water system because they were dealing with such extreme rainfall events that it blew out the canal, the intake for their water system. They're flying a Chinook, you know, the two bladed big helicopter dropping the 3,000 pound sandbags, trying to build a berm to protect the intake so they didn't lose the water system. That was in 15. 2016, we got so much flooding in the parishes around Baton Rouge that one of the parishes saw up to 70% of the structures flooded and impacted. And almost none of that was inside of a flood zone, which is a big misnomer that I blame us at FEMA for creating that term. There's no such thing as a flood zone. It's a flood insurance rate map. And I got asked this question in Florida, which kind of came back up with the flooding in Fort Lauderdale last week. Uh, how do you know if you need to buy flood insurance in Florida? And my answer is, is does your driver's license say Florida on it? <laughs> <laughs> to the point where a very woke legislature now requires under their state backed insurance program policyholders for citizens will now have to start buying flood insurance whether or not they're in a special flood risk area or not that's florida not exactly what you would consider a progressive adaptive state dealing with climate change but they're realizing without insurance people can't recover so we started seeing these rainfall events we started seeing the fire events and it turns out those were the two clear signals we were seeing in climate, temperature and drought, including flash droughts, and extreme rainfall events with a variability that no longer could explain it. Fast forward to the last couple of years. I love the headline from the Washington Post. Five, 10, 5,000 year flood events in five weeks last year. So this idea that our infrastructure, our response systems that were built upon always looking backwards at extreme weather events isn't working. And so I like to you know, borrow from Einstein. I think there's this tendency that, as President Obama says, we got to talk about adaptation. To me, it's always the biggest challenge is when do we start doing things differently? And what we're doing and what we're seeing, and I can go look at anybody's climate resilience plan, I'm going to tell you, I know what this, they're going to say already. They ain't doing anything differently. They're doing what they've always done a little bit more and a little bit faster, hoping it's going to change the outcome. I don't think anybody has a clue of how fast this is changing and how bad it's going to get. And I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm just telling you, you built infrastructure and coping mechanisms based upon a relatively stable period of extreme weather events. They happened about every five to six years. They were spread out enough. There was enough time to recover from them. Now they're stacked. They're coming in so fast and heavy that not only are we, as a response organization, it's not able to keep up. Talk to the Red Cross about just having volunteers in donations, given the frequency of response. We're also losing affordable housing at unsustainable rates. It caused me to coin another term. If you thought the Waffle House was bad, I got a new one for you. It's called the resiliency divide. Is we're making investments based upon our primary practice of mitigation of putting investments in on risk avoidance of cost benefit analysis. For every dollar I put in, how much do I save? We use this term a lot, $4 to $9 to $13, depending upon who's talking. But for every dollar of mitigation we invest in buying down future risk, we get a corresponding reduction of exposure. But think about that cost benefit analysis. For every dollar I invest, I get X amount of savings. And that was, has been the primary driver of where we have made what little bit of investments we've had. Most recently in the Biden administration, uh, they're able to leverage the Building Resilient Infrastructure Community Program, which is the pre-disaster mitigation program passed in the last administration and the Trump administration, and are leveraging it towards billions of dollars for programs that used to get 
tens of millions to hundreds of millions. But the majority of our investments in reducing exposure and risk is based upon how many dollars do we save? And it produces the unintended consequences of growing a resiliency divide. An example, my Herald did an article a couple of years ago about the flood insurance buyout program. They found the majority of the money went to the wealthiest zip codes. Why? Because you have to have cost share. So you got to come up with 25% of it. It is a long-term process that can take up to a year. It requires an extensive expertise and grant staff to manage that, which means you just ruled out every poor community that has vulnerable populations because neither can they manage the grants nor can they do the cost share. Same thing is happening with all that billions of dollars. We tend to focus on the communities. These are complex programs. So the first thing is, do they have the grants management staff or can they hire a contractor to bring the staff in? So start thinking about every small community, community of color, rural communities, rural America, where we actually may have greater risk, but they don't have the resources to even get the grants. And the other thing is we're chasing how many dollars we're saving. Well, trust me, in New Orleans, we saw this play out. It's a lot easier to write a grant down by the lakefront than it is in the Ninth War, because those homes over the lakefront were even back before Katrina, the million dollar homes. And so for 100,000 I invested there, I'm gonna get a lot greater savings than for 100,000 I put over in the Ninth War. So the bias was creating, not through intention, but through programmatic measurements and application and complexity that where we have started making investments to buy down future risk, it tends to be in the communities that have the greatest capability to absorb that risk and recover from it. And so Deanne, Criswell and FEMA and President Biden are working to how do we get this bias changed and how do we focus on impacts to people as our primary measure, not property and dollars. And so this will be something as we go through, but as we're dealing with climate, it's like I keep telling people, it's already changed. This is climate with a D at the end of it. This isn't something that will be in our future. Even if we achieve the Paris Accords, even if you stop the emission, and first of all, Climate change is a really bad way to describe this. It's really come up by the fossil fuel industry to convince everybody this wasn't a crisis and we didn't need to deal with it. It's global warming. We're putting a lot more energy into the atmosphere, and that's why we're getting more extreme events. People say, how do we get blizzards with global warming? I'm like, because we're really empowering the jet stream to bring Arctic air further south than we normally would, durations that we normally hadn't seen before. It's energy. But our programs in the U.S. were built for stable periods between crisis, not disaster after disaster after disaster. We built our infrastructure. <clears throat> How many people, have, if you've done any type of planning or anything like that, they always look at the last 100 years worth of weather to determine what we should build to. This was fun. My, my brethren in the military, I always find that, you know, we should, I, if you're gonna go in the private sector, just call yourself low bid, you'll get a lot of contracts. They built the hangars for the F-22 fighters at Tyndall Air Force Base to the local building code because it was low bid. And the Air Force's justification was we built to what the building codes were. Well, the building codes are fun because when you go back to the American Society of Civil Engineers, you go, why is there this little carve out in the Florida Panhandle that has lower wind speeds for building codes than anywhere on the coast? Well, it's because they threw out a hurricane they thought was an anomaly. And then they averaged out the ones they did have. And that's how they justify the wind speed. It wasn't that you couldn't have those wind speeds generated on that coast. It was just, they had a couple of storms and they thought one of them was an outlier, so they tossed it out and didn't use it in the average calculation. And that's why you saw a little carve out where Hurricane Michael made landfall. And the Air Force being, the Air Force was like, hey, we'll build to whatever the code is. And you're putting F-22 fighters in there? And a couple of those hangar queens became surplus piles. The other thing that happened with Tyndall that you need to understand is we're losing housing at unsustained rates. So Tyndall Air Force Base, it took them a while. They got base ops back up. And if you, if you don't know where Tyndall is, it's, it's basically about 25, 30 miles to the east of Panama City Beach. And it's where they have one of the largest live fire exercise zones in the Gulf of Mexico. 
it's where all the surplus aircraft ended up getting painted red toll tails and, and flown as remote drones for pilots to go shoot down. They do live fires out of that place. They also got a lot of other stuff there. It's a very interesting location. But even with getting the runways back up, getting the fuel handled, getting the fence back up, getting security back up, they couldn't bring their tenants back. And that's what the military calls all the operations on base. You know what the limiting factor was? No housing. Give you an example of how bad housing is there. Waffle House, I, I, I know the CEO, he was telling me this. He said, we got our stores open. People are driving an hour and a half to two hours to work their shift at Waffle House because all the affordable housing got wiped out. And remember that little town, Mexico Beach, that got wiped out in Hurricane Michael, Cat 5 Hurricane, and everybody said they'll never come back, all this stuff. They're back. I drove through it last year. I was shocked. I didn't realize I was driving through it because I drove through it all my life. I didn't even recognize it. But what got built back was Airbnb choice prime territory. It's all condos. It's all built on a higher code. They have a much better tax base, and nobody that lived there before can afford to stay there. And so from the standpoint of climate and the standpoint of then where I think star ties kicks in, it's not only what we're seeing in the U.S. that we're seeing with the coping mechanisms. Everybody, you know, I think it's kind of like, you know, haters are going to hate. But when DOD, and then this goes all the way back to when Bob Gates was secretary, and they started putting in climate change as one of the national security threats, people were like talking about from the standpoint of, well, sea level rise, all this stuff. I said, no. I was at NATO. I got their attention with this one. I said, you know, we've been doing what I call the oil wars for the last 30 or 40 years. We're about to enter the water wars, where if you think about it, from the standpoint of famine, from drought and so, it's been a logistics issue. It's never been we didn't have enough food. It's just we couldn't get it to people that needed it either because of conflict or inability to get there. We've never had the situation where we had a global supply crisis of not enough food to feed everybody. Yet, when you start getting one or more regions that are impacted, it causes the price to shoot up. A lot of people go back to the Arab Spring and says the root cause of that had more to do with the price of wheat and bread than people realize. You know, people thought it was a social media phenomenon. Like, no, price of food went up. People weren't employed. What's happening on our southwest border is very much a climate-driven event. Everybody thinks it's Mexico. I'm like, Mexico's economy is actually pretty healthy. They're actually going back home. What you've got is prolonged drought, hurricanes, flood, lack of opportunity. But the ones that are really underappreciated is how badly impacted those areas have been hit by profound drought affecting their growing seasons and the hurricanes that have been hitting down there. And no housing, no prospects of things getting better, and they're moving north. And people are going, well, we'll build a fence higher. I'm like, really? How's that worked anywhere else? And so from the standpoint of DOD, we're at the tipping point where the conflicts we've been dealing with are getting worse and the destabilization. I, I, my, my counterpart in uh, Australia, when I was at FEMA, Mark Croswell, he was the director general of, of Australia EMA. He said this, he said, you know, in our business and crisis response, when people talk about national resilience, we basically boiled it down to three things. Can you defend yourselves? Can you protect your economy? And can you maintain the confidence of your public during a crisis? And we're seeing how destabilization of both famine and drought, but other extreme weather events are causing governments to fold. And for DOD, the last thing you want is a destabilized government in a conflict zone, because what comes in behind it either tends to be the authoritarians or our frenemies step in and establish bonds and relationships that threaten our strategic interests. So this goes to this whole gauntlet of, it's no longer just about the future, it's now. This is no longer doing what we're doing faster and more of us gonna solve the problem. We have fundamentally have gotta rethink this and start redefining outcomes and what we need to do to get there instead of always looking backwards if the answer is gonna be there. And this is, both from the standpoint of not just our future generations, it's happening right now and our systems are not keeping up. So with that, that's the challenge, you know, Star Ties and others are trying to get, what are we gonna do differently? 
because doing what we've always done, as Einstein would say, and hoping the outcome will change is a sign of insanity. So that, any questions before we go with our panel? <laughs> <laughs> start. So where do we start? Where, where if you had top two priorities, you would say? In the US, and I think this is globally, it's housing. Um, survivable or sustainable or quickly rebuilding after. I think there's a lot of, you know, depending upon where we're at in the world, but in the U.S. in particular, we're losing affordable housing at such an accelerated rate that we're displacing workforces to the point where it's affecting national security, it's affecting the business community, it's affecting energy sectors, and it's affecting our ability to recover. Governments like the fact that when they get gentrification, they get an increasing tax base with lower demand for services because all those Airbnbs aren't sending kids to school. So there's this, we got a weird sense in this US of rewarding the gentrification at the local level of government when they rebuild because they get a better tax base, they get lower demand for services and they export their poor. That's not sustainable. So we got to figure out one, how we get housing back faster, but more importantly, how we build affordable housing. Cause I can build hurricane resilient housing. I mean, I got good friends over at the Institute of Business and Home Safety and Roy Wright who's the executive director They've got their fortified standard. It adds 5 15% to the cost of new construction. That's not the problem. The problem is what does a new house cost and what an interest rates do? do? And most people are renters. And that affordable housing stock, when that home gets destroyed and I'm going to repair it with my insurance money, am I going to continue to rent it for what I was? If I'm going to make all those repairs or do I go up? And so, we're losing too many of the affordable housing stock and our disaster response program doesn't address it and it ends up costing us taxpayers more. And again, this is, this is reality. I try to institute emergency repairs under FEMA shelter authorities because uh, we don't have permanent authorities to replace housing. That's what HUD does. But here's, here's what we found out. We could spend $80,000 repairing a home in New York City and get people back in and not make it fully repaired, but just enough to get the certificate of occupancy. I mean, I turned the power on, they got heat. I could spend 80,000 and replace their heating system, their boiler, and get them back in. Cheaper than putting them into a hotel for 18 months. And that's exactly what we did with folks from Puerto Rico. We flew them from Puerto Rico, put them in motel rooms and all kinds of places, Orlando, New York City stuff. We paid those hotel rooms for 18 months, and then we said, the program's over, you're on your own. And we never made the investments back in Puerto Rico to recover, rebuild, or even achieve some housing. And again, once people leave an area, if they cannot quickly get back into their communities, the likelihood of them going back diminishes. We saw this in New Orleans. Where again, we saw another case after Katrina, gentrification that took place. But a lot of the original residents that got sent to you know, Houston, Atlanta, wherever, never went back because nobody was rebuilding the Ninth Ward. There's a couple of show pieces down there, but you can still drive around the Ninth Ward. There's a lot of vacant lots. It hasn't come back. And what does come back, nobody can afford that used to live there. And so I think housing is probably a very complex issue that the standard issues we have, the tools we have, the way FEMA and the federal government approaches disasters, the way community block grant programs structured through HUD are not capturing the demand signal for affordable housing. And my observation in a lot of the disasters that take place internationally, I see the same thing, is the donor communities will come in with the temporary fixes and leave. And then the long-term housing solution is basically left to the people. Those governments just don't have the resources. And so we then end up with even less sustainable housing, or we end up building back just to fail again because it's too expensive or just not enough. And I think that's the other thing is why does that have to be so expensive? Why do we why can't we rethink how we build? What kind of materials we use? Why are we not thinking about, you know, I heard this a lot after Puerto Rico, we're gonna do microgrids. And now we if we went back and rebuilt the utility the way it was. We got a few niche things in there. But I mean, to me, it was a tremendous missed opportunity. I'm like going, why aren't we doing solar and wind and breaking this grid up so a hurricane will only take out pieces of it? 
you know, why are we, why are we still, and I'm still on the board of a major utility. Why are we still in this big generation far from where it's being consumed? And then we create all the vulnerabilities on the supply chain of moving a power distribution from where it's being generated to be where it's consumed. Why are we spending more time talking about why don't we generate electricity and energy where it's going to be consumed so we don't have the single points of failure? But what do we do? We spend our money rebuilding utility because they got to generate revenue to pay off their bonds and the people that made the investments and were holding debt. Very true. As a matter of fact, FEMA is being sued right now by a coalition of Puerto Rican corporations and nonprofits because they're aiming to rebuild utility base based on fossils. So maybe they'll learn their lesson. A question for you. How can we change the thinking within FEMA, having you been inside FEMA, uh, on some of the basic tools that we use in the field. Farms talk about flood insurance rate maps. They don't consider this proactive look at sea level rise. We know what the projections are. Why not include those into firms and just stay basically on the forensics? Sea level rise is a, a rounding error in the exposure to the flood insurance program. It's the extreme rainfall events. If you look at what happened with Hurricane Ian, the big losses were inland that weren't insured. Uh, so what they were doing and started as I was walking out the door, but what they got done in the last administration is risk 2.0 which is moving away from putting everybody in the same risk profile because you're in a special risk area and going, it's different. And we're gonna start pricing it. So it's not necessarily taking into account sea level rise. It is taking into account the closer you are to the sea, you're gonna pay a lot more. But it's also trying to get to this inland flood issue that we were pricing policy so that this is the way it worked. If I was in a coastal community, I paid less for flood insurance than if I lived in an inland community that was dealing with um, river rain flooding, even though theoretically we were both in a flood zone because one was paying more than their risk and one was underpaying it. So part of what FEMA is trying to do is, yeah, they don't have the models yet to incorporate the sea level rise to the degree they need for the actuary tables. But what they are doing is they moved away from pricing risk uniformly in a special risk area and doing it by structure. So you're gonna start seeing pricing pain points that are gonna start affecting behavior. They'll grandfather in a lot of stuff, but they, again, Congress raised a lot of grief about this and they're not happy with risk 2.0. And I know several senators, both on the Democrat and Republican side that are threatening to kill the program. I'm like, great, when you get 51 people to vote with, you change it. They can't get there because the fiscal conservatives also wanna see flood insurance rates go up. But it's the first time that short of being able to incorporate sea level rise into the firm maps, we're actually seeing pricing more reflective of the risk. And that, as we get better data and as they are able to incorporate sea level rise, will be adjusted as you do risk 2.0. Because again, they've moved away from everybody gets treated the same in the special risk area to you're now doing it by structure. And so one was the imbalance of a lot of communities, and this turned out to be a lot of times communities of color that were paying more for flood insurance. <clears throat> than what their risk was. And they were subsidizing more affluent, predominantly wider communities and coastal communities who were paying the same flood insurance rates because they were all deemed to be in the, the category A zone. So it's starting. Um, so there, there is hope there. But a lot of this is going to come back to the minute you start raising rates, which is what you got to do, the price risk to change behavior, Everybody threw their hands up in the air and said, this is the worst thing possible. Of course, they haven't stopped it. And I learned a long time ago, there's a tendency to throw your hands and yell a lot when you know it's the right thing to do and then let it happen. <laughs> so I go back to my constituents and said, I objected to it most strenuously. But it's still, well, I couldn't get the rest of them to vote. And that's, I think, the last thing, because we got a panel we want to go to is, I think what we have done in the U.S., we have priced the risk so low that we're not changing behavior, but those coping mechanisms are breaking. Look across the South on insurance, looking the West Coast for fire. We already dumped the flood insurance program on the federal government back in the 60s. A lot of these financial mechanisms are breaking, but until you raise the price high enough, 
to change behavior. The tendency is for builders, developers, and everybody else that has a very short interest in basically what the transactions are. It's hard to get them to do something different. So, yes, sir. With the lessons learned from past natural disasters and the need for better logistics and a microgrid model so that the power can be turned on quicker in these disaster zones or not take out so much of the network itself, is there a way for FEMA and the other agencies that are looking forward, such as the existential threats from a black sky event for a regional or national grid shutdowns and the deficits that we have in logistics capacity to respond to those kind of events. Is there a, a model that could be used in a collaborative fashion? What we have to do is figure out, because again, I, 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 truth in advertising, I sit on a board of a major utility, is, and I'm an investor-owned utility, is you have to figure out how to break that system down in a way that still generates enough revenue to pay for the infrastructure to run the backbone. And so we're not opposed to solar, we're not opposed to battery storage, we're not opposed to microgrids. In fact, we're actually finding a solution to some of our wildfire threat, but we still have the legacy of the infrastructure to pay for. And what we've seen is another resiliency issue. People that can afford it are going solar, and people that can't afford it are paying more for that backbone system because they're having to pay, although you got fewer consumers to buying that product, the operating cost didn't go down. So it's getting passed on the people who couldn't afford solar. So it's uh, it's not easy. And the lesson learned thing is like lessons observed. Uh, very rarely do I see them get into where we're actually changing what we're doing. So we got a panel to go to, unless you guys want to go through your happy hour today. <laughs> <laughs> so the panel will come up and we get started. Hey, Irish Your choices are here or at the front. Okay. You're up. All right, I'll I'll start. I guess so I think this is is that good? Yes. Okay, we're recording. I guess. Uh, my name is Michael Dunaway. I am at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, or NIST which you may know the acronym, uh, what you may not know is that NIST is actually a research laboratory for the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, and as a consequence of that, we work very closely with business. We work with industry, research universities, and with other agencies as well. So it's a very diverse group of, of, of uh, authorities, and I mean that in the intellectual sense, that work in the projects that we're in. My particular area is in smart cities and communities. And NIST has a program to develop technologies and to assist communities in integrating advanced technologies to solve local problems. So this can be problems having to do with what is the number of potholes and how efficiently can we fill them? Or it can be uh, what kind of environmental monitoring sensor systems do we need to put in place? And how widely do we need to position those sensors in order to get a sense of what the community's input is and the community's risk level is for a given uh, for a given uh, situation. Uh, or it can be how do we integrate artificial intelligence into the way that we do big scale data management to understand uh, uh, the relationships between Internet of Things, the social community, the natural and built environments on both sides, and how that affects things like economy and how it affects with the ability to recover from disasters. So it's a pretty broad portfolio. Uh, I've been with the program now for about two years. Uh, at NIST, I was actually involved in the very first meeting that stood this program up back in 2014. So I've been involved in smart cities for a while, but the program is now beginning to make some transitions and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Hi, yeah, um, I'm Iris Ferguson, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense for Arctic and Global Resilience within the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy, it's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> So thank you for having me here today. And my driver's license says Florida, and I am really concerned about my hat. <laughs> um, I, 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 uh, we're renting our house, actually, and I moved up here for a couple of years for this job, and um, our insurance rates have gone through the roof, and I did not know about this new flood 
requirement. And we'll have to go back <laughs> and do some research. So thank you for that flag. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's becoming more challenging, I think, from a pricing perspective as, a, as someone that uh, owns a house down there. Um, yeah, so uh, my office is new within um, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and uh, we're charged with looking at both Arctic security, but also global resilience issues, um, looking at the from more of a global perspective, really, and how our combatant commands are uh, looking at risk um, in their theaters, how we're working with allies and partners, uh, and then also how we're looking at adapting our installations and, and our operations. Uh, so there's just th three really quick takeaways for, for the DOD, and I know that we're going to spend a bulk of our time probably in the Q&A at this point, but um, one, just take away that the DOD is um, very much thinking about risk uh, from, from climate issues. Uh, it's reshaping our geostrategic, our tactical, and our operational environments, and we are very um, aware of that. Uh, it's creating new quarters of competition, like in the Arctic. I'm um, happy to dive into any of the kind of more you know, macro geostrategic issues um, as well in the Q&A. We're also really focused on integrating climate um, considerations into all the department does, into the resourcing, into the planning, into our strategic guidance. It's a lot of what my office does is, is working on strategic guidance, like the National Defense Strategy, where we really underscore um, how the department should be caring about these issues and where and why and how. Um, unlike probably any other agency in the U.S., I think the Department of Defense is driven by strategic documents. Uh, it, I, 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 I came from the Department of Commerce and moved over to the DOD, and I had no idea how integral documents were to the functioning of the department, but it's a big deal. And so I don't want to suggest that these, these documents are throwaway messaging pieces. They actually literally drive resourcing and prioritization. And the fact that climate change and climate risk are written throughout all of them at this point, and we're continuing to iterate on them to further um, drive resourcing prioritization is, is really important. And then lastly, it, it, we recognize that we can't do this alone, and that really we need our interagency partners and also our allies and partners um, to really tackle this threat. Uh, so, you know, I'll go to, turn it over to Q&A, uh, since you know, I think our time is limited. Yeah, I, I got two questions, uh, for one for both of you, but uh, we'll start with DOD. When I first met General Milley, he was Army Chief of Staff, and he, his big thing was readiness. And one of the things that I think he's carried over as chairman is the idea that we don't get time back. And the idea that this is not something that's like in the future, but it's affecting things today. Again, when they first started talking about this, it was always what it was doing elsewhere in the world and maybe some long-term effects to our installations. But given everything else, how's that really addressing his thing, which was always readiness? Like, we don't get time back and war starts tomorrow. We got to be ready to go. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's complicated. I'm not going to tell you that that's it's been solved entirely. I think when you're looking at long-term planning cycles, that's what the DOD does well at that, but you're also being called upon to fight tonight. Uh, and so how do you square these long-term planning needs with the need to be ready now? Um, and one of the key ways that we're, we're doing that is focusing heavily on operational efficiencies. Um, the department is very keyed in on the China problem set uh, and trying to ensure that if we needed to fight, we could fight tonight and that there, we have recognition that there are long logistic tails involved with, uh, with the Pacific. And so really focusing on how we gain operational efficiencies with our aircraft, with our, uh, with our ships, uh, and looking at how we can have um, expeditionary capabilities in those small islands that we do have access to. Uh, are, are we having mi building microgrids? How, can we actually potentially create fuel from sources such as even CO2 and air? I mean, we're doing some really incredible R&D work in this space. So that's where the department is leaning very heavily is investing in some some very uh, some R&D in, um, in enhancing our, our operational efficiencies in, in addition to ensuring that our installations are, are more resilient. And then for NIST, um, the thing that I was fascinated about NIST is how much advanced you were uh, most of the standard making bodies when it came to new codes, new standards, that NIST was actually driving that on the research side. And given the smart city and stuff, is, is that the role NIST is best prepared to do to keep leading that charge? Because it, to me, was always, it was the one government function that was always further out in building codes, engineering standards than where industry was often starting from. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, so I've, I've undergone an, an interesting intellectual change at NIST uh, and in the Department of Commerce. So I'm uh, previously with the Department of Defense. I was in the Department of Navy, did a full career, wrote strategy documents in the Pentagon for the Department of Navy. 
Um, so I know a little bit about how strategies are written and why, and uh, I'm in the process of writing our own right now because we have no strategy for smart cities at the NIST level or anywhere else that I'm aware of at this point. So we're trying to develop that. Um, interestingly, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies does not write standards. This is something I've come as a, something of a surprise to me since I've been in the agency. What we do is we write frameworks and guidance documents to enable the private sector, the commercial sector of the nation to write the standards through a collaborative process of acclimation, really a process of distillation where best practices and the usages of them over time and their employment in the commercial sector, basically the, the purchasing of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the capabilities, the technical capabilities, basically evolves into a standard. And it's a standard that is adopted across the commercial sector by individual industries or by basic, uh, basic even by communities in some cases. And that is how we write standards in this country. We have uh, agencies like the American National Standards Institute that actually produces them. IEEE, the uh, International Electronics Electric Electrotechnical, um, yeah, IEEE. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get the recognition. I'm a member of the Those organizations actually write the standards. And the standards are then available then for adoption by commercial interests and by communities and by individual organizations. But NIST actually doesn't write them. What we do is position the commercial sector to do that kind of offering. Uh, and the frameworks that we write actually establish those. That's kind of what we're doing in the smart cities arena right now. We won't write a smart city standard. But what I do hope to produce is a strategy that's, that the communities can adopt to, re, to identify their levels of risk in the particular areas in which, which the effects are noticeable, obviously, for their geography, their demography, and their, uh, their infrastructure systems, and then evolve the mechanisms at the local level that will enable them to build resilience, both on the technical side for, uh, for uh, infrastructure systems, but then also on the social side, the socioeconomic side, to ensure the long-term uh, long viability of the communities and their, their economic systems. Yeah, I, I'll, I want to come back to this idea because I know from FEMA's standpoint, we looked at this to provide us with the technical framework, as you would say it, to work with what should be the building code for earthquake resilience. Uh, I know from the fire service that a lot of NIST was looking at as we would see things happen, what would we do differently? And I think that was one of the things I really appreciate about this was they were the honest broker of coming up with the tool sets and data that ultimately from the National Fire Protection Association, the International Code Council, developed codes. But it was usually based upon the original research and documentation that this provided to say, this is what you need to do differently. And then the code making process would actually implement that. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. I, I really appreciate that's a That's a strong uh, that's a strong moral support for what we do for what we do at NIST to the, to the degree that I'm now involved in it. Um, from my perspective, having been here just for a few years and worked in a couple of other agencies, including DHS at one point, the the honest broker status that NIST enjoys is kind of our stock and trade. And we work in my in my particular group where we're working for smart cities. We're trying. We have the, so the nomenclature smart cities is incorrect but it's also pretty much adopted by everybody. So we're sticking with it. Uh, I've actually changed a couple acronyms to community, uh, but the emphasis is kind of still on the, uh, on the program. But we are trying to help any community of any size, of any sort, and any demographic who has either a program in operation or an aspiration to become smarter in the way they do city operations, in the way they relate to their communities across the board, and the way that they uh, engage with communities to help build a consensus about what the priorities for their own community could be or should be, and then what kind of technologies can we bring to bear to achieve those goals? And that's the real objective. Thank you for that. And you know, for DOD, the Arctic, I can't remember what that Allen was coming on of the Coast Guard. And he was trying to get people to understand, we got one icebreaker. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, this will be a huge disadvantage and the Arctic and right of navigation and DOD, and I can remember 
even when I was working with people like Admiral Courtney at you know, Northcom, it was like getting people to understand that the Arctic is changing so fast that it's a new domain. It's not like it's all frozen over and nobody goes there anymore. Uh, so from DOD's perspective with the Arctic, but other things you're seeing, um, what's your sense of, because this, this long-term planning was like we got 10, 20 years. It's like it happened already. Uh, how, how is DOD playing one that, but also in looking long-term? other potential changes that are occurring more rapid than are traditionally adapting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tricky uh, when you have a, a region that's been somewhat othered um, in the last 20 years. And we think, you know, when it was very much a focal point in the Cold War. Uh, it was we, we had to be operating up there uh, with frequency to be able to engage with uh, Russian long aviation, long range aviation. And um, really, at the end of the Cold War, we were kind of sort of closed the door on, on the Arctic, refocused in the Middle East. Um, and there's been a bit of a, a, a reawakening, I would say, with the department. A lot of um, trying to relearn some lessons really about how to operate there. Uh, but it's not it's, it's not without its challenges. It's, it's still, it's you know, it's not necessarily the top priority of the department. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It should mean we shouldn't be planning for what should happen there. Um, but uh, there is tension there. Uh, you know, we're really heavily, even, even if it is challenging from a resourcing perspective, we're still operating with heavy presence there, especially in Alaska. Uh, we have a lot of air bases. Actually, there's more F-35s, more fifth generation aircraft in Alaska than anywhere else uh, in the world. Uh, we're also seeing with our, um, our NATO partners um, with uh, Finland and Sweden soon to be joining um, that they're bringing immense capability, uh, not only geopolitically aligned, but have really highly capable military as well, and being able to work closely with them and understanding the region, leveraging what they bring to the table is really critical for us. Uh, but we've been, we've been, you know, we've been operating in the Arctic region for quite some time. We still have a lot of the infrastructure that I mentioned from the Cold War is what we use now. Infrastructure is so critical to, to pull from in the Arctic in particular because it's so hard to operate on the surface. And so really making sure that infrastructure is sound, uh, ensuring that as uh, permafrost is melting, that uh, that it's that the, the infrastructure we rely on, our runways, for example, are up to snuff. CREL, which is the Cold Regions Resource uh, Research Lab, uh, which is an Army-based organization, is the world's preeminent permafrost experts. And they've actually been working on permafrost for decades. It's not something new. Uh, they were responsible for um, really mitigating a lot of our permafrost at Thule Air Base in Greenland, or now Greenland to Pitifuk Air Base. And they used to actually paint that runway white uh, because that was the most cost-effective way to keep the runway from cracking because it had permafrost underlying. But now we have such a great ability to model permafrost and mitigate it that a lot of the challenges that we have to infrastructure have really, from a from an engineering perspective, have been solved. Uh, for for the U.S., I think that we're doing better than our adversaries at that. Quite frankly, because we have such uh, rolled around research in it. Uh, but there are things like coastal erosion, um, where we're you know looking at those historical maps. It's not going to work for us uh, because you can see we have a lot of our radars along the north slope of Alaska. Um, the the modeling is not keeping up with the current pace of coastal erosion. So understanding what is at risk and what we need to invest in, what kind of seawalls we need to build. Um, there's also understanding the geopolitical dimensions and the changes that are taking place, not only in the environment, but where our adversaries up to and what are their capabilities. So you know, my office, I am, I am charged with trying to knit across the various uh, services and combatant commands that all have their respective interests. They all have different requirements. The services all have their own individual Arctic strategies. Um, and who's trying to align and integrate? It's, it's really my office. It's the first time there's been a home to try to drive some of these conversations um, really around domain awareness in particular and communications and ISR and a lot of the things that we take for granted in the lower 48 that we have, haven't necessarily invested in uh, sufficiently up in, in the Arctic. Um, so that's a, a really key focus for, for my area and, and I would, for my office. And you know, I would just say it's a, it's a work in progress. Well, if you thought I was dealing with complex issues on the <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now we've uh, opened it up to anybody here to ask questions of the panel. Um, sir. Uh, America used to be noted for its innovation and small innovators could have great changes on industry. How do we get back to that sort of rapid acquisition <laughs> process where you don't have, we, we've seen the consolidation of all the prime contractors in the, for the work for Department of Defense, and, and there are fewer and fewer of those nowadays. So how do we get back to improving the acquisition and, and adoption process 
so that we can leapfrog our adversaries in these areas. Yeah, I can I can address that from the perspective of, of NIST, um, uh, and I'll begin it by arguing ever so slightly with the premise of your question. <laughs> um, what I see at the smarts in the smart cities program, which is the area that I work, um, innovation is very much alive and well, and it's taking place at the local level. Most of the most of the businesses and the communities that we work with. Uh, communities tend to hire local business to do even some very advanced technology work because they want to keep the business close at hand and inside their communities and inside their tax base, among other things. But they also want to grow workforce development. Uh, they want to increase workforce development. They want to establish the ability of their communities to benefit from the members of the communities who are the most imaginative who are developing technologies. So I would say that probably 75% of the, of, the, of the businesses that I work with, that we work with, I shouldn't say I, it should be we, in the 200 some odd smart cities in the country that are members of the GC, the Global Community Technology Challenge, which is the NIST, name of this program. And we have 40 overseas partners as well, 40 other cities internationally. And I would say probably 70%, 70, 75% of those are small businesses that are locally owned and locally operated. And they're working with their communities. Some of the very large businesses that we operate with uh, who work on an international or national scale and are also working in these areas, they're collaborating, collaborating with those smaller, smaller businesses for the same, for the reason that A, it gives them entree into, into small business uh, uh, opportunities as well. But they also gain uh, advantage by building that workforce uh, capability across the board. So in the in the area that I'm familiar with, which is at this stage is smart cities, um, there is an awful lot of innovation going on. Um, and I it's not so much, particularly in the area that I'm in, that we're trying to leapfrog anyone. We're really trying to share information. And the, the, the core mission, I think, of the NIST Smart Cities program is to position the community so that they can share and gain information and gain awareness across the board. Um, and one of the projects that we have standing up here in the, in the near future is to, to develop a, a, a basically a, a repository of lessons learned, going back to our favorite phrase here in many cases, but to establish a place where this information actually can reside, where people can access it. That is one of the problems with most lessons learned organizations is that the, the, the distribution of the lessons just doesn't get very far. So one of our missions is to try to establish a uh, an area where we can have that, that information made accessible and available to other communities. Now, this has been a big challenge for DOD, though. And I know DARPA and others have looked at how do you get this into the innovation space while maintaining when you're building an aircraft carrier or a submarine. That is going to be a large procurement. It's not going to really adapt itself to emerging technology. DOD is actually going pretty far out trying to reach those emerging technology, encourage them and, and bring that in. Yeah, that, that's my perspective. Um, you know, and I would love to honestly, you all might even know more than I do in this space because it sounds like you engage really heavily with the, with, with the tech sphere. Um, but, you know, from an installation perspective, I know that we've been really heavily leaning forward on development of microgrids in particular. Um, we could look at Miramar as a great example in California. Um, they can actually operate for 21 days, um, including the flight line, without any without any um, uh, power from the main grid, which is really incredible, quite frankly. So we're looking at that across the board from an installation perspective to see where are our critical assets and where do we need to ensure that we have the ability to operate. Um, should there be um, a disaster or storm, hopefully nothing akin to what has taken place at Tyndall, for example, as you mentioned earlier. Um, on the operational energy side, I should say also that you know a lot of this, the dar DARPAs of the world are the ones that are pushing the envelope in this, um, but the, the services themselves have their own innovation um, as uh, you know, units, AFWORKS, for example, within the Air Force is kind of helping look at Air Force specific needs um, and looking at, as I mentioned, that fuel um, R&D earlier, looking at sustainable aviation fuels is one area. But we're also taking lessons from the private sector, too, in a lot of ways. In some ways, when you're talking about green technology, um, the DOD is go, working side by side in, in some ways, too, especially with, around uh, aviation platforms. The winglets that we're putting on our aircraft to reduce drag um, and, and, and increase our range 
are things that we're taking from the commercial sector. Uh, so we're really trying to work hand in hand with them as well as problem sector. Sir? Well, again, I have a question for, for actually all of you, which is, uh, first of all, on behalf of IEEE and Optical Society. Uh, International uh, Electrical and Electronics Technic uh, yeah, Engineers, yes. Yeah. 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 And, and Optical Society of America, which is now called Optica, we every year go to the Congress and uh, advocate for you guys so that the Congress yes, you know, looks at the right policies. But that day, now that we have the Chiefs Act here, what is NIST nice doing? I will say that as a small business person myself, it's very difficult to work with NIST. Nice. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm saying it to you. So, regarding the Chief Act, is there anything you know that the small businesses can help with NIST or others, the DOD? With it, yeah, interestingly, the Chips Act. Um, it, um, so, the director of the Communications Technology Laboratory um, has is is. Once, once the process is completed, is probably going to be taking over as the lead for the CHIPS Act. So an individual at NIST is going to move directly over into the leadership position of CHIPS and, and a few of our staff persons are going with her. Um, that is going to, I think, spearhead a lot of that relationship between NIST and the, the commercial sector that actually develops the technologies and we hope develops the really uh, technical basis for, uh, for a resurgence of industry in that particular sector. Um, I can't really speak to that too much, but it's not exactly my area, but uh, I know that the program is just now beginning to reorganize and or to organize, I should say. The initiatives will be underway probably within about six months or so. I, that's what I would imagine. Um, and I think we're gonna see a real relationship grow out of that uh, with a close relationship, I should say, with ANSI, IEEE, and other technology uh, um, Sponsoring nonprofit organizations that, that really are going to, I think, support the development of a real new technology or not a new, a revitalization of the technology base in the country. So I look forward, we, we might have a conversation with this afterwards. Look forward to talking. I, I honestly I mean, uh, don't have anything. Well, okay, I'm going to give you a different answer. And that is, Everybody wants government to be able to deal with small businesses more effectively, get more contracts out there, and they can't understand why they don't do it. It's because of how many hearings have you start Congress start with that they're there to drive out fraud, waste, and abuse. And for government agencies, they got so much bandwidth and so much time and very little tolerance for risk. So if I have a choice between betting on an unknown company with an unknown product or going with one of traditional acronym Beltway companies that doesn't know what they're doing that are real good at acquisition contracts, what do you think I want to do? <laughs> and that's the bias. It may sound really hokey, but trust me, I know a lot of contracts to get issued, not based upon the competency of what they're doing, it's the competency of their grant administration and the ability to do the procurement process. And it provides the least risk to the government employees. Remember what happened in the Obama administration when they went out there and started betting all new industries with solar and other domestic, and they actually won more bets than they lost, but what did you see the hearings about? The one big company that failed, and that now became how they defined that program. They didn't talk about the successes. They talked about the one big failure. So until Congress decides that risk is acceptable, and defines that in a way, I think too many programs and too many folks that administer these programs are risk averse. And so doing a contract with another, I mean, think of simple things like making sandwiches. You think issuing a contract for making, how hard could it be? Yet, if you go back to Hurricane Maria, what FEMA got blasted for was contracts that went to companies that somehow got on a GSA list, got the bid, and were making sandwiches in their house. <laughs> All right. States. So you think FEMA's ever going to do that again? So that's what we're up against. We're against fraud, waste, and abuse. We have a very low tolerance for risk. And federal employees tend to go with what's known versus the unknown. And that puts small businesses at a disadvantage. The only time we break through that are DARPA and others that are out there looking at the wild cards. And they actually have the permission to go out there and lose. I mean, DARPA makes a lot of investments to them, but they're one of the very few entities that that's actually their mission. 
And until you change that, or you at least introduce, because even DHS, they tried to do this with science and technology. And they never got, they were supposed to be the DARPA for Homeland Security. Well, they became something else. They're not DARPA. But until you form the ability to go out with what I call micro grants, a high tolerance for risk and acceptability that things are not going to work out, they're going to blow up and to make those kind of investments. That's not going to change. And it really is a tell them that we got to change at Congress that they have to acknowledge there is more risk to move down to innovation than it is to go with the primes that are safe, predictable, and basically a waste of time. Question and I acknowledge the presence of retired General John Wharton who co-authored a piece on um, smart cities and the theme was smart islands. So I'd like to know from NIST, uh, what role you're playing now that the Deputy Secretary Dan Graves has been appointed by POTUS to head all of the recovery efforts in Puerto Rico. Now that we also have the attention of the Secretary of Energy who's <laughs> pushing a lot of activity out to the field, uh, given the discussions that we've had so far in strengthening the microgrid and the virtual power plan and the smart island concepts. Are there any roles being played at this time? Um, so informally, yes. I sat in a number of working group meetings about this very issue and uh, would be really interested in participating in some of that uh, in what we what we can. Um, that the development of this is kind of a, a clean slate problem. We're having a, a, a I'm party to a couple of conversations taking place about Ukraine right now, with very much the same issue. There is a clean slate with an enormous opportunity uh, in, in Puerto Rico's case, right in our hemisphere, in fact, right next door, uh, in which we have a special status by virtue of Puerto Rico's uh, uh, position as a, as a protector of the U.S. Uh, territory. So there's a very close natural relationship there, which I think opens up an enormous opportunity for uh, technological advancement uh, to the good of everybody. And we hope to see that advance in time. It's a very preliminary conversation right now. Uh, if I have an opportunity, you know, speaking of assemblies program manager, if I have an opportunity to position what I am doing so that we can we can not only advance Puerto Rico's case, but to use it as a test bed for some of the technologies that we're developing, I think that's an ideal opportunity. And it could really spear point something else I'm interested in, and that is getting more engagement on the Caribbean in general, which uh, which all of those all of those islands and all of those island nations are highly susceptible, as, as obviously we know from recent experience, to all of the threats that most concern us uh, uh, nationally and within the Caribbean basin. So I think there's enormous opportunity. The, the conversations right now are fairly early on, and we're not directly, certainly I'm not directly involved in those at this stage, but I think there is much to be discussed about that in the future, and maybe you and I can have a conversation about that yesterday. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the question. Certainly. If I have a, a question for Dilly. Actually, if, if you don't mind, I'm out of drink. And <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, by way of introduction, my name is Aaron Rose. I'm the uh, chair of the Certize Advisory Board. And so I want to say, first and foremost, thank you to our panelists and our speakers for a very engaging conversation. Um, We've got uh, two days full of activities uh, starting tomorrow morning. Our exhibits will open up at uh, 9 a.m. And uh, they'll be open here on Merton Law on from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. We have four panel sessions tomorrow, uh, one in Puerto Rico, one in energy. Um, should have all this one on, uh, that, uh, on, on the, the Center for uh, sustainability and, and resilience community, CRASC, that here at George Mason is organized. Um, and then we have one on uh, uh, disaster uh, relief um, and uh, smart innovations. So we're going to cover the gamut uh, over the next two days. Uh, we'll start uh, with our first panel at 9 30 tomorrow morning. Again, exhibits open at 9 a.m. Uh, we'll take a midday break, but we do have a uh, hosted lunch uh, tomorrow. And uh, hope you'll join me. Um, again, we'll conclude today. Let's go next door and continue the conversation uh, over food and uh, beverage. So thank you very much.